Part five, Monsters 101, the days of Noah are here, guys. Now, in part four, I left off, right, in second Ezra, I read to you, Esau will be the end of the world, right? All right, so let's start from the beginning of Esau. You got to go all the way back to Genesis 25, and I'm going to read verses, uh, actually, I'm going to read verse 23. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, that's Rachel, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. All right, two people means two nations, two nations, the etymology of that word, the root of that word means two races of people. All right, they are two very different races of people. They are not of the same kind as what got in the boat with Noah. Now, it's just like in Genesis 1. That race of people is not the same kind as Adam. They look similar, such as Esau, if you look up his name in the concordance, that number is 6215. It means red, hairy garment, R not flesh. Okay, it doesn't say flesh. It says red, hairy garment. Now look up Adam. Adam also means red. That number is one, two, one. When you look up the number one, two, one, you will see ruddy as in red. But then it says the first man, he and he came from clay, from the earth. Now, in all of genealogy, in all of genealogy throughout the entire Bible, and I've read them all, it's tedious, it's long, but it's necessary. Only one time is a person's skin color ever mentioned, one time. Do you find that odd? Only one time that a person's skin color is mentioned, and it's here in Genesis 25, 25, where it says, Esau, red, hairy garment. All right, so that's where Esau is born. So Esau is born first, and then Jacob. Now, in making the Genesis, what you're going to need, your kids are going to need to learn this. It's really important you get out of church and academia, out of indoctrination, and get into the truth, because the days of Noah is going to be pure lies, and it's going to be worshipped as it was in the days of Noah. Everyone's going to worship them, and that's going to cost you and your kids your eternal soul. All right, in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Genesis 1 is making of the Elohim race. All right, I see how God, through, as an example, Esau, who became the Edomites of Mount Seir, how they are going to suffer for the fall of the angels. It's, it's just one example. Now, if we go to, and you're gonna need, I'm gonna, I'm gonna preface this, because I'm gonna end with understanding Alexander the Great, as in Daniel's prophecy. All of this is about prophecy, all right? You can read the genealogy, I'm not gonna go through that, but if you go through the genealogy of Esau, starting in Gen Genesis 36, Esau has a son, Eliphaz, who has Amalek, who in 1 Samuel, there is the uh, king Agag. He is the king of the Amalekites. In Esther, you have Haman. Haman is an Ag Agatite, all of which come from Macedonia, the same as Alexander the Great. Okay, so I just wanted to put that there because I'm gonna end with that. I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna bring it full circle and make it come around. Now, another thing to note, Cain, once he kills Abel, he is sent east of Eden to a land called Nod. Now, look at Nod in the concordance, all right? Nod means a land of exile, and it means a land of wanderers. So, one, so Cain, is said to be an exile and to wander the earth. Now we know he gets a wife, we know he builds cities, but at the root, this is what's happening. In exile and he's a wanderer. Now Cain 
asked for a mark to be given to him so he's not killed by whoever it is outside the garden. Which Genesis 1, if you believe, if you understand, not believe, but you understand, you think for yourself, get out of being churched and indoctrinated of what the devil wants you to think about his angel dark race of beings and their hybrids, okay? He knows he's going to be killed by them. So he gets a mark. All right, mark in the concordance is number 226. That means a miracle, an omen, a sign, or a token. If you just take those words right there, especially the word token in ancient Hebrew, and understand all of the verses that have the word token in them about the end of days, again, I can't get into that. I'm trying to concentrate on the, the, the what comes from Cain is... Uh, curse is cursed it is eventually Canaan and there comes from Canaan Esau his wives will be the daughters of Canaan that's what all this is about a race of people red hairy people all right so now we know Cain is the father of the wicked and Jude Jude talks about People following the way of Baal, the way of Cain, and following the way of Baal, the way of gainsaying Kor. I'm going to get into that. It goes more into these races of people. But the point is, there are 17 verses in the Bible, all of which none will tell us that Cain was ever killed or that Cain ever died. Okay, so... I mean, if you look at all the genealogies, we know when everyone dies, all the way back to Adam. We see their genealogies. We know how old they are. We know who kills people. All right. And no, in 17 verses of Cain, the only thing we're told in Genesis 4.24, he becomes a wanderer on the earth. He, it, it, is that not odd? That the son of Adam, we're no, we know when Adam died and how old he was. That we don't know about Cain. All right. I'm just putting it out there for you to think for yourself. Decide what you will with that. What we do know, right, is that Cain is the firstborn of the snake that started this entire biblical war. This entire fallen agenda, this entire biblical war that started all of the prophecy is that the snake, this upright, intelligent being that was cursed to go on his belly and eat dirt, which, by the way, we humans are dirt. In case you didn't know that, we humans are the dirt, the clay, the ground <laughs> that the snake is eating. That's us. Cannibal. All right. So what we do know is the snake does have a seed, and that seed was Cain. We're told that by Jesus. Now, I'm asking you to think for yourself, is that not the first Nephilim? Is Cain not the first supernatural, interdimensional, very big, very strong, mighty man which we're not told ever dies, that is ever killed. All right. Isn't Satan giving his angels a heads up? Here's how to do it, guys. Here, let me go into the garden and do it first since I have access to the garden and you guys don't. I, I, I've got access. I'm still a supernatural high-ranking being. I still have the ability to go into the garden and usurp mankind and mankind's dominion. I'm going to, let me show you how this is done. Let me show you how I'm going to deceive Eve. Let me show you what I'm going to promise to her. And then she, in return, will get her man to follow suit. Is that not what Satan's doing here? And does not the fallen angels follow suit by the time we get down to Genesis 1, 26 and 27? But before that, may I just put out there, and a big point of this video is before... The image, the seraphim, the Elohim, which is the seraphim, before they make man in their image, okay, man's just a phantom, an illusion, a shade, looks like man, but it's not. It's a fiery flying snake. They're dragons. They're reptilians. Uh, before that, a stronger race than man is made. Is it not the beast of the earth? It's interesting when you study over 300 verses with the word beast in them. 
I highly recommend it. All right, I did it. So, okay, so I ask you, is not the first Nephilim Cain? Is that why by the time you get to Genesis 6, right, and the watchers come down and they take women of men, daughters of man, who they want at their will, the women had no say in it at their will, and they bore offspring, they had children, they mated, they had sex with these women, and those offspring, why were they all of a sudden called men of old, men of renown? How could they have been called men of old, men of renown, if there were not something before them? That I'm, I'm just saying, think. I'm not saying anything other than these are questions you can find in the Bible when you dig enough. I'm just putting it out there for you to think, to become curious. I'll, I'll get us around to that. I've got a lot of videos on that. I'll, I'll bring us all around to that. But I'm just putting, I'm just trying to poke a little hole into your indoctrination. We've all been churched, all right? We've all gone through the snakes education system. You know, we just have to deal with that, let go of the programming and move on. Now, now we come to a race that Father God put into Rachel that is not the same as Jacob. And Father God, I'm gonna often call him just Abba, it's just easier because that's what Jesus called him. So Abba hates Esau from the get-go. All right, so again, in Genesis 25, 25, there's two nations in the womb. Esau, the red hairy garment, he marries two wives. He actually marries three wives, uh, all of them from the line of Canaan, which was cursed by Noah. So, as I begin part five here, let's read from the beginning. As the days of Noah, our progenitors, right, our creators, the ever, uh, I guess, worship superhero Elohim, they will be the ones that always have been and, and big time will begin to proudly, as in drag queen, as in woke teachers, teach our kids the truth of Genesis 1 that the church has been indoctrinated out of the truth, right? The truth was, there needed to be a time that would fit the fallen angel agenda, that would, that would give the Elohim the right once again to usurp a larger, much more valuable generation to them to win them over, meaning our kids, our young ones, our little ones, the fig tree generation, right? All of that's going to be revealed. And our kids will think they're gods. Now, they've been told by the History Channel, if you go from about 30 years old and down, they're Anunnaki. They're ancient astronauts. They are our progenitors who made us in their image. Our Bible tells us that. And now you'll go read the Bible for the first time. It's like, oh, yeah, it's right there. The Elohim made us in their image. Do you, do you see the clever lies that the church has dumbed you down and indoctrinated you out of when they read Genesis 1 for what it actually truly says? Je Elohim, the little G gods, no one knows that they're fallen. And it doesn't say that in Genesis. You don't know that. You don't understand that. If your kids just go read Genesis 1, mom... We were made in the image of Elohim. That's all these little polytheistic gods of the, of the Parthenon, the pantheon of gods. Saturn, Mars, Zeus, Thor, Superman, Batman. Do, do, do you see, do you, are you getting the bigger picture? Are you, are, you, are you with me on this one? If you care about your kids' education, you get them out of snake system beast system. Again, there's over 300 verses with the word beast. If you want to understand the beast system, read all three, I think it's 304, read all of those verses and understand the difference between the beast in Genesis 1 that has nothing to do with man and the beast in Genesis 2 that has to do with Abba. There's a huge difference. There's the beast of the earth and then there's the beast of the field. By the way, the field means the cultivated field, cultivated in the enclosed garden. That may have just blown 100% of the people watching this right now. Genesis 1, beast of the earth, that's what it says. Three verses in Genesis 1 
beast of the earth. That's entirely different because beast of the earth there includes the underworld, includes Sheol. I'll get there. So, so what are the Elohim? Again, they are what the Mayans told you they are. Like they, they gave it the name Quetzalcoatl, Quetzalcoatl, whatever. Fiery dragons, they're snakes. They have wings. To say, it's all of the Mayan legends, all the Aztec legends, all of the dragons of all of Asia, all of the blue-skinned people with many arms, right? Just like the statue of whatever that statue is called, in the in, some Indian god name, I don't know. But it's in front of CERN, right? It's helping to further open the pit for their king, Apollo, Apollyon, Abad, 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 Abaddon, in the Hebrew tongue, Abaddon, uh, to come forth, all right? These guys will have supernatural powers. They will have signs and wonders from the heavens, right, from above. Just like, again, nothing new under the sun, the Tower of Babel. Once again, it will come to the point where they can do anything, all of which they want. Now, God, the first time, took his hand and smashed down the Tower of Babel and confounded their language. The second time, Jesus will just come, open his mouth, and it's done. Everybody's in the fiery lake. Now, again, going back to Esau that I ended part four with, um, it said that he will be the end of the world. That's our timeline because a thousand years is as a day to God. So how many years has it been since Esau? We're at the end of time. When you read the ancient Hebrew, you understand how close we are. There's nothing more to be done. Prophecy is done. The only thing there is is the second coming. The last seven years in the second coming. That's all that's left. With a few minor things that can all happen in the last seven years, such as the total destruction of Damascus. A lot of prophecy chronolo chron chronologists, how do, you, how do you say that word? They think that first Damascus has to come. Well, Damascus can come in the last seven years. It doesn't have to come first. So in an effort to upload this <laughs> sometime today, let's end part five and start with part six, right? Amen. Potter out.